My name is Average Joe, and I'm a proud geek with expertise in movies, superheroes, and animation. My name is Beef Pork Ribs. I'm a fine repository of esoteric knowledge, which I suppose most people would qualify as geeky. Though I dabble in many fandoms, my main areas of expertise are anime, movies, and Belgian comics, with a strong recent insurgency of D&D. Our mission is to bring nerd and geek culture to the masses. By sticking it all under the microscope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Bat Jar, Jar Podcast. Podcast. Movies, comics, graphic novels, TV, cartoons, animation, nerds are geeks, entertainment culture, here it on the Bat Jar, nerdy pal, nerds and geeks, come gather around the scene, come and join us in the Bat Jar, come and tune in to Average Show and his team, here in the Bat Jar, when the newest nerdy news drops, these caught us pals, put it under the scope, DC, Marvel, Disney, Star Wars, cinematic, multiverse, it's Hello there, and welcome to the Bat Jar Podcast, where we put nerd and geek culture under the microscope. You know, we should have recorded three episodes at once to save time and uh, get better continuity. Yes, indeed. This is, in a sense, a sequel episode because we have previously talked about the Lord of the Rings, but because it's such a huge thing, we literally spent the entire first episode of this conversation, which was like, I think six months ago or something. I can't remember when we'd literally spent a whole episode just talking about the books and the significance of the novels for the Lord of the Rings. And the Lord of the Rings movies was like a topic ooh, that was originally thrown in the Bachelor in the very beginning. And to my delight, it has delayed its appearance until now. Uh, and to the delight of everyone else, it is finally time to talk about Lord of the Rings movies. And I guess because we had a fellowship with us the last time we talked about the books, now I guess we have two towers worth of people here to talk about it. So, <laughs> so we are, it's another big episode because guess what? Lord of the Rings is a popular topic. So joining us, we have a new guest. We, we haven't had a brand new guest on the show in a long time, but uh, joining us for the first time, we have Prequel Joe. Welcome to the show, Prequel Joe. Thank you for having me, Average Joe. Now, as you're new, people who are going to want to know about you. So first of all, what kind of nerd or geek are you? I would say I am the the nerd or geek attracted to epic things. So things of large scale, long mythologies, large massed battles, whether it's in space or in fantasy land, anything of huge scale with a long history. And somebody who clearly nerded out writing the writing the lore. That's that's the kind of thing I'm attracted to. So in other words, you're only interested in something that's gonna take a whole lot of homework to understand it. Basically, basically. And I mean, yeah, like where you could go on deep dives down, you know, fandoms and Wikipedia pages for a couple of hours and pretty soon you have forty five tabs open and you've forgotten what time is. Do you have an opinion about every fandom having its own like version of Wikipedia that everything's gotten away from Wikipedia proper? <laughs> hey, you know what? It, I yeah, I, I, I the only thing I don't love about fandoms and wikias is uh, ha- being bombarded by huge full screen ads as you're trying to figure out <laughs> what happened in the Star Wars expanded universe. <laughs> so what um, you're saying is, once we start the Bat Jar Wiki, it will have to not be ad free. <laughs> well there's a there's a there's a price for everything um i don't understand this terminology used the expanded universe i, I only know of star wars legends <laughs> there you go Mea culpa. Uh, what, <laughs> so what kind of nerd or geek would you want to be i would say i'm happy as i am although yeah i i was sharing earlier that because i'm attracted to not any one particular nerddom or geekdom as opposed to a particular substrata, you know, then I don't have, I haven't gone as deep in one particular or two particular kinds of things. So perhaps if, uh, if I had a different direction in mind, maybe I would have limited it to one, one plot line or one particular franchise, but alas. Well, we're happy to have you here. I'm sure you're going to have lots of interesting things to say about a movie series that I am openly very, very openly have claimed to not be a fan of, 
but it, I don't dislike these movies as well. So just let's just put that out there. I'm not a hater. I don't dislike Lord of the Rings. I just don't love it. Maybe by the end of this conversation, I will. But you know who does love Lord of the Rings are two returning guests. Uh, first, let's welcome back Ben the Movie Buff, who, of course, for newer listeners, a former co-host of the show and a frequent guest. I can't remember when you were here last, but what is something nerdy or geeky you've been up to since you were last here? I think the last episode I was on was either Free Guy or Suicide Squad, so it's been a couple months. But uh, yeah, something nerdy I've been up to is um, I'm trying to catch up on all the Marvel shows that are currently on Disney+. Plus. I watched WandaVision shortly after it came out this year. Then I watched uh, Marvel's What If a couple months ago. I just finished Falcon and the Winter Soldier literally 45 minutes ago, and I thought it was uh, pretty that's, good. That's, in this show, that's called Snowy Owl. Snow- <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. But uh, yeah, probably after this podcast, I'll start watching Loki and then get to Hawkeye in the next uh, week or so. So just trying to catch up on, on my watch list. I have a bit of time off around Christmas, so lots of movies and TV to watch. So you are, in fact, the Watcher now. I am the Watcher. (laughs) And uh, also returning for the first time in, we think, at least six months, possibly longer, we have Libra the Book Lady. So Libra, what have you been up to? Um, I actually just watched uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings yesterday. Um, So much fun. So, so much fun. Um, and I've also been, uh, fixing some of the gaps in, uh, my watch history, which includes, don't come at me, the original Cowboy Bebop series. I've watched the first two or three episodes, like, four times over the last ten years and just never got past that, and just because of other things, so I'm sticking to it, it's, it's on, uh, an actual streaming service now. So I am, I don't have to go to shady corners of the internet to find it. So I'm making my way through it. And uh, yeah, I am having a blast with that. So yeah, I I do do take personal offense to that because uh, Cowboy Bebop, the anime has been on the Funimation streaming service for a few years now. So, I mean, that's a legit one. It's, it's, it's certainly a lot smaller than like Netflix, but it is available on Netflix now. So yes, at least Cowboy Bebop isn't one of the shows Funimation used to have for free on their YouTube channel because they used to have like all of Soul Eater and Hitalia and a few others just on their YouTube channel, both subbed and dubbed for free. Oh, okay. Well, every time I tried to go and watch it, it was just, I ended up in shady places and yeah, maybe it was longer ago than I think. So. Well, it, and I don't blame you for not making it through Cowboy Bebop because I literally mentioned this last week on the podcast that it's a very kind of sad and dark and it's, it's a, it's not a show you want to binge. You kind of have to like sit and process each episode. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, something you can just like power through like the way the house husband, like it's something you actually have to kind of digest. So also, and fun anime little like three or four minute snippets. If you want to watch them way of the house husband on Netflix is, hilarious and amazing so as we usually do in situations like this we gotta do our secret origin segment where we each explain how we were introduced to today's topic so this is of course focusing on the lord of the rings movies so ben the movie buff because you're the movie buff it's in your name we'll go to you first how were you introduced to the lord of the rings movies Sauron has returned the ring must be destroyed i cannot do this alone there is evil there that does not sleep. The quest will claim his life for Frodo. Jeez, so as far back as I can remember, I think I, I ever since I was very young, I knew lots of people who loved books. I'd heard about the books, and I guess for whatever reason, I just wasn't a big reader when I was young. So I heard about these books, but I never thought to actually sit down and read them. So I was aware that they were kind of part of our our pop culture. And then, of course, um, in the summer of 2001, I went to go see this uh, movie called Spy Kids, directed by Robert Rodriguez. (laughs) And uh, I remember um, in the preview of that movie, 
I remember seeing this trailer of all these red clouds in this ring, this gold ring slowly falling uh, into frame and hearing um, the, the trailer guy, the, the announcer saying, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. And I was like, I, I think is that Lord of the Rings thing maybe? And then once I saw the teaser trailer, I was hooked. It took me a while actually before I got to see the first one. But um, once they were actually making a movie, obviously all my friends that were big fans of the books would not stop talking about it. And that got kind of got me more excited about it. But I hadn't read the books. I just heard basic things from my friends and about why it was the best thing ever. And it really is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's kind of how, how it all uh, started for me. And, and little did I know how much the trilogy was going to uh, change my life. And I'm not even exaggerating. Like, it's kind of why, why I'm doing what I'm doing today is, is all because of uh, Lord of the Rings. Okay, interesting. Beeper, does uh, your secret origin here involve the French version of the movies? No, not even close. Um, actually, it doesn't even involve the French version of the books. Um, I mean, The Hobbit was the first thing I read after I graduated from uh, Magic Schoolhouse. Um, and then I read the sequel afterwards, which was a bad habit I had it as a kid to just read things um, as they went together. Uh, and so I had r read Lord of the Rings, probably much too young to really grasp it. Uh, but then the movies came out and I actually did not see any of them in theaters. Uh, because I don't know, I'm not exactly sure why, probably because I had younger siblings who would not have been able to watch it at the time, uh, for sure. Yeah, that's probably why. Uh, but then, uh, my sister was a huge fan of the books as well, and she had read them properly and done a few university papers on uh, Tolkien because she was in medieval studies. And so uh, when the movies were out and on DVD one year, our parents got them for my sister and I for Christmas, uh, extended edition. And we just and then it was Christmas. So uh, this is about my French heritage. We went to Midnight Mass and then had uh, Réveillon, which means we ate after midnight mass and then opened our presents and then started watching Lord of the Rings. So we watched a uh, fellowship between the hours of like two and five in the morning on Christmas day and then um, slept for a little bit and then watched two towers and then watch return of the King um, on boxing day. And then after that, it was kind of a tradition. We watched Lord of the Rings during the Christmas holidays for the next four years. And then I also watched it an additional uh, three or four years after that every year uh, in or around the Christmas holidays. Wow. <laughs> I, I haven't even finished the whole series once. So that's amazing that you've seen it that many times. Uh, and I'm getting some cringy faces there. Okay. Uh, prequel Joe, what's your origin here with the movies? It was a lot more serendipitous, actually. My dad just felt like taking me to a movie, and he arbitrarily chose The Fellowship of the Ring as an 11 year old. And I was like, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. We didn't know, he didn't know it was going to be like a three hour movie. <laughs> and, and to be honest, like, I remember being terrified within the first 20 minutes. Like, it's a dark, dark opening. But then I was like, oh, huge army. I'm like, I was my 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 peak. My interest was peaked at that point. So uh, and then that dovetailed into getting the again, just I mean, I'm Filipino, right? So like we don't have a strong heritage of like English literature in my family. Uh, but for whatever reason, my Filipino aunts and uncles felt like buying me the entire novel set for, for Christmas. They didn't even know what it was, but they knew they, they heard about this Lord of the Rings thing. And so that began the downward spiral. <laughs> uh, um, Christmas is coming up a lot in these these uh, origins. It's in, it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Libra the book lady, we of course know you're a huge fan of the books, but how are you introduced to the movies? So I was actually reading the books because my librarian had, uh, like my li the librarian at my high school had recommended them to me which is how I got introduced to the books. And I was in the middle of reading it when they announced the films. And um, of course my, you know, the 
teaser trailer looked amazing and we kind of got it obsessed with it like my family is one of those families that like we kind of do everything together like if one of us finds something good we share it with each other and it just gets passed around and so the same thing happened with the lord of the rings books and we had i don't know if anyone remembers the the covers of the like the edition of the book that they released right as the movies were coming out it was like the the fellowship going up the mountain and it was all in the different colors and so we had i still remember very clearly that my mom and one of my sisters had finally caved to me and were reading the books like in preparation for two towers coming out the following christmas and because we'd seen the fellowship everyone loved it and so we did actually see them i did actually see all of the movies in the week that they were released um so when we were reading the books to prepare for two towers being released my mom and my sister were both fighting over who because they were at about the same point in the two towers and they were taking turns reading it and they ended up fighting and they ripped the book clean in half so our family copy of the two towers is just ripped like straight down the middle but um yeah that was kind of like i was the instigator for my family to really be attached to the movies but yeah i have all of these memories and revolving around the movies and going to see them in theaters the weeks that they were released for three years in a row. And that kind of became a Christmas tradition with us. Like, so the older siblings would all go together with mom to see the movie. So yeah, it was uh, kind of like, I was like prime audience, you know, new fan of the book, perfect age for the movies. And yeah, it was just like, everything fell into place. I have a very weird relationship with these movies because I honestly don't even remember the first one coming out in theaters, but my, somehow my parents got the VHS of the fellowship of the ring and it, it must've been like six months after that movie had come out because I was at my parents trailer in the summer and it was night. And I remember somehow we put the fellowship of the ring on and I appreciate you sharing prequel Joe of being scared because yeah, I was only like, 10 or 11 years old when that first movie came out and I was I think what probably it didn't like capture my heart because it was scary like the the Nazgul's and just the, the atmosphere was very mature and my little brain couldn't handle it like I got nightmares when I was 13 watching Batman Returns you know I was not used to the, the darker stuff so even though Two Towers was coming out in 2002 I was too busy hyping up toby mcguire spider-man and attack of the clones i was like those <laughs> those are the movies i'm interested in seeing and it didn't really interest me that there was a second lord of the rings coming out but then i had friends who were enjoying this so i ended up seeing return of the king the third one in theaters like the week it came out before christmas and i infamously remember falling asleep <laughs> in the theater and i know everyone here is like how could you fall asleep during return of the king I think because of the, obviously there was so much that I didn't understand from not having not watched the two towers going to the third one. And the fact, I know it's infamous for having going on and on and on with like too many endings. Like it certainly felt like it dragged for me. So I saw the third one in theaters and I didn't hate it, but obviously I fell asleep. So <laughs> that says something. Point of clarification. You went and saw return of the King in theaters without having seen the two towers correct okay breaking my heart joe <laughs> come on man it was what my friends wanted to do and i didn't want to like say no and Peer i think part of the tension for me has been over the years i have you know i'm i have so many friends who are catholic who just adore lord of the rings and at a certain point something gets so hyped up you're just like all right i get it enough like go away i'll come to this when i want to everyone's so, doing it joe yeah, I know. I just give in, Joe. Join us. <laughs> and I've seen about not half... jumping off a bridge, just watching a movie. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've, I've seen about half of the two towers now, but it's like weird because I walked in on people watching it, so I seen like the middle part. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I was gonna watch two towers in preparation for this, but 
Uh, my girlfriend, who is living happen. in a different city right now, has kind of claimed the rights to watching that movie with me, so I don't want to okay, take that fair. from her. And I knew there was going to be enough people here who knew what was up that I wouldn't have to have seen it. So that's that's where I'm coming from coming into this conversation. I would like to say one thing about because you brought up Attack of the Clones. The Two Towers is how to do a you know middle of the trilogy movie. Attack of the Clones is how to not do a middle of the trilogy movie. <laughs> but yeah, I know Star Wars is a whole other kettle of fish, so yeah. Anyway, so diving into the Lord of the Rings movies, obviously I'm not as much of an expert and I'm going to be leaning on you guys. So I just come up with some questions that are related to these movies. Some of them are about like the actual content, some about how the movies were made. It's 20 years now since The Fellowship of the Ring came out, which is weird to think about because it came out in 2001. And <laughs> here we are. Now, came out the same year as Mega Man Battle Network. I know what Mega Man is, but I have no idea what Battle Network is. Anywho, all right, so my first question to you, Lord of the Rings people. I've gotten different answers to this over the years. Are the movies good adaptations of the books or not? Starting it strong. Yeah, so I'm going to start uh, with my opinion, but I feel like it's fairly well shared. They were good adaptations, and they were adaptations that were that in which a lot of effort were put in order to adapt them, which I think is part of why, <clears throat> like, I would say, yes, they were definitely good adaptations um, because they still, uh, there was a lot, the, the, they treated the source material with a lot of respect and they did make insane amounts of efforts in order to not just keep what was essential to the story and what was important and good in the story, but also in order to make uh, the story work into good movies. And I think like Lieber, the book lady kind of um, like pointed that out that like the two towers is how to do a middle of the trilogy movie. And the two towers took a lot of liberties with the sequence of events compared to the books in order to make a good movie. So I'd say that on that, from that point of view alone, it deserves to be called at least a good, if not an excellent adaptation. I lean towards the latter. Yeah, I think the thing we have to remember um, whenever you're adapting anything is that uh, I think as uh, Beeper said earlier that, you know, as incredible as the books are, if you were to just take word for word what's in the books and just put it in a movie, it might not translate as well, right? And I think that's why, like, it is kind of an inherent thing with, with every adaptation, things are going to change. So they can either be more cinematic so that, you know, the, the whole trilogy is not 20 hours long. Um, there are all these things that have to be taken into consideration. And I know I've heard from a lot of my friends certain problems they have with, um, you know, as much as they love the movies, that they're like, oh, I wish they did that differently. I wish, you know, like, oh, Tom Bombadil was in Fellowship of the Ring and whatnot. And uh, there are still points that people can bring up, and that's totally fair. But I think given from what I've heard, and, you know, yes, I did watch the movies first before I read the books, I do think they are faithful and good ap adaptations because uh, really like I think making a per perfect adaptation is a very, very tall order, but given, yeah, everything they had to do and um, what the movies became, I, I would say they succeeded. I think there's a certain level of understanding what the ethos or the mythos of the books were trying to communicate and then trying to replicate that on screen where on screen, you still have a very strong experience of goodness and of redemption of good over evil, uh, even just as it was communicated through the music and through the visuals and those kinds of things. And of course, there are elements in the movies that were very Hollywood or um, certain things like that, which maybe marginalize the goodness that that you were kind of seeing or hoping for the wonder that you experienced as you read the novels. I still very much experienced that strong sense of wonder. I think um, there's this philosopher, um, uh, Peter Kraft, who talks about how um, people who love Lord of the Rings are almost often good people, like almost always good people. And I would say the people who love the movies 
are almost always just decent people, you know, like, and, and I, I, so in, in that sense, I would say that the movies translated at least the, the, the core uh, identity of the novels with, with some slight blemishes and imperfections. And I, I also, I think it helped that the director was relatively unknown and that a lot of the actors were relatively unknown. So it wasn't laced with the trappings of Hollywood. And so it, it, it allowed it to be its own, have its own identity without the trappings of Hollywood or without the trappings of, you know, cinematic success, even though certain people were supposed to play certain roles that didn't work out, thankfully. So anyway. Yeah, I definitely think that given the amount of source material that they had, it's a miracle that they kept it to the times, even the extended editions it's a miracle they kept them that short. Um, of all the adaptations I've seen, it probably is the best. Because the thing is that they did change that, like, even as like a hardcore book fan, there were things that they were, like, as the movies were being released, and as they were being promoted for, you know, like, oh, this is what's going to be happening in the next movie that's coming out. Um, there were things that were spun in the marketing material that made us upset. Uh, particularly the way they portrayed the fact that, like, Arwen is dying. And it's like, she can't die she's an elf like that's not it just you don't you don't understand you don't know what you're talking about and i actually recently rewatched the extended editions with my cousin um a couple months ago and what the marketing material took as you know, she's dying it's like no she's <sighs> there's hmm, there's so much source material <laughs> she's descended of a line of el of people who can choose between mortal and immortal and she's chosen to be mortal and so there's a lot of power that comes with being an elf that is now being taken from her because she made a choice and that's what it's very subtle in the movie but if you don't know all of the things in the background of what's happening in the books then it's really hard to translate that onto film and people can read it and see it and read it cinematically the wrong way. But, you know, all of that stuff aside, yeah, it is a really, yeah, it's a really good adaptation considering, the, yeah, the choices they had to make, so. So I'm getting the sense yeah. it's the best it could have been considering how dense the source material was and how many characters there were and how complicated the story was and how expansive the oh, world yeah. building was. I mean, a testament to the screenwriters, Philippa Boyens, Fran Walsh, you know, it's, yeah. it's no, no mean feat. Now we saw Dune not too long ago, and that was kind of a whole point of conversation in our podcast on that movie was that there oh, were good. elements of the world building like in the movie, but they were never addressed and never spoken about. And because those things weren't spoken about people in the audience, like myself who hadn't read the books, it didn't even register for us. It just sort of felt like an Easter egg. And I'm assuming there's probably a lot of that for the Lord of the Rings movies as well. And again, as a noob, as an uneducated pleb, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Like even the languages, like we did an episode on con langs and I'm like, Oh, there's different elven languages and they mean different things. No idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that led to one of the nitpicks of people that people had about the movie when, um, when Frodo asked what the elvish word for friend is, because clearly, you know, Frodo speaks high, high elven and would know what that is. And it, in fact, in the book speaks it with Gandalf, you know, when they don't want other people to understand what they're saying too. And also with the group of elves that they run into in the Shire while he's still on his, like leaving the Shire before he even makes it to Brandy uh, across the Brandywine. Like he, the, the, in the move in the, it's in the extended editions where they see a bunch of elves going to the Grey Havens in the books, he and uh, Sam actually, and I think Mary and Pippin are with them 
um, possibly only Pippin is with them already at that point. And they actually, like, spend a night hanging out with the elves, and Frodo converses with them in Elvish. And, like, Pippin and Sam fall asleep next to them, and he, like, it's this elf that he meets who warns him about the riders, and that they need to get out of the Shire, and they're not going to be able to just stop at Bree, and they're going to need to keep going. So, yeah, Frodo knows Elvish. Like, it's just, maybe he had a brain fart and just forgot. Are you sure you like these overwhelmed. movies? It sounds like you. you <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds like you've got some issues with these movies. Uh, yes, but what movie is there? A perfect movie? A goofy movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say Hot Fuzz, but you know. Oh, Hot Fuzz is so good. But now, I feel like whole... that's in the same category as like my nitpick when we talked about Dune about Mentats and how like they really didn't they kind of got a little bit jibbed in the movies like not in a terrible way but it was something that you know I personally thought was really annoying as a fan of the book. It doesn't mean I don't think that the the new Dune movie wasn't good. It was still great but it, it had definitely problems with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this whole extended edition thing, I, I've I've heard of like director's cuts of movies where you know you get an alternate version of the film because I guess the version the studio liked didn't align with the director's vision. But I don't think I've heard of many cases other than Lord of the Rings where they've created like an extended version of the movie because I guess the one that released in theaters they had to cut down for time. Yeah. I'm like, why even bother with the theatrical cut when it seems like everyone just prefers the extended editions? Well, the extended editions were not a thing until after all the movies had been released. So they, we didn't know we were going to be getting a director's cut. Basically. Like, so that wasn't done until all the movies were released. And then it was like, oh, by the way, there's also this version that you can watch with all of the extra stuff. And it's not just the fact that it's, um, Ben will probably correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, <laughs> um, it wasn't just that there, the movies are longer, but it's also, there's like two discs and like, many 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 hours of interviewing cast and crew and artwork called the appendices because Tolkien is famous for his appendices in the books so they made like film version appendices for the movies which is what you get when you buy the extended edition I can go and grab mine upstairs and show you I should have brought them down but it's two discs of movie and two discs of bonus features and bonus features doesn't even, like, just those words don't begin to cover it. So, sorry, Ben. No, it's okay, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, for the record, like, the extended editions of Lord of the Rings are, like, the gold standard when it comes to home video, when it comes to um, being uh, comprehensive and, and having all these different interviews, featurettes, this and that. They're amazing. Uh, another point I wanted to bring up, too, is that, yes, if I remember correctly, I think there are two factors as to why, like, you do a theatrical cut and then you do an extended cut. Um, so for one, yes, it's quite possible that for time, it just made sense to like, oh, you know, you do the theatrical cut of the movie and certain scenes maybe have to be left out or whatnot. Um, so, so there's the running time of the actual movie. But I think the other thing to take into consideration, too, is all the extra time it takes to put in those extended scenes and, uh, and, and those additions. Because if I remember correctly, I think all on top of just editing all those scenes in, cause like you have, you have two kinds of like, this is the thing I like about the presentation of the extended editions is that it'll tell you whether a scene it, like is the same as in the theatrical edition, but then it will also tell you this scene has extended shots or, or, or parts that are added. So like Balin's tomb, the fight at Balin's tomb, we see in fellowship of the ring, obviously, but then in the extended edition, there are some additional beats that we did not see the first time around. And then there are just also like brand new scenes that, that we didn't see at all in the theatrical cut that we get to see in, uh, in the extended. Um, so you also got to take into consideration the time 
and money that it costs to like edit these new scenes, put visual effects in for these new scenes, extra music in this and that. So I think it's kind of a whole thing that takes extra time. And I think that's why really it's a brilliant idea that you have the theatrical cut. Everyone goes and see it, makes lots of movie uh, money in the theaters. And everyone's like, oh, this is great. We love it. And then you get the DVD and then you buy the DVD. And then it's like, guess what? There's a sneak preview for an extended cut where you get more, more bonus material and you get a longer movie. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. But but I think it is kind of a wise choice that you show everyone the theatrical cut in theaters, and then if they want the extended version, they have to they have to pay for it later on. And I think this movie also had a little bit um, a lesser version of kind of like you know the fan campaign that got the extent you know the, the Snyder cut, but and it wasn't so much fan driven, but there were like. Because I remember several interviews, both in the appendices, because I have watched all of them, uh, but also outside of that, in which some of the actors, and particularly Christopher Lee, was very vocal about some of the things that had been cut that should still be in the movie. And he, and like when they chose to make the extended edition, again, Christopher Lee would like rave about it, mostly because his character got the conclusion that he thought, um, well, that, that, that Saruman deserves and that Christopher Lee really wanted. Um, and, and so he wasn't the only one. He probably was the one who pushed the most, but you, you can see like a lot, like the, you know, Peter Jackson also, like most of the crew wanted the extended edition to exist too. Like that was closer to what they kind of wanted to make as a movie. Um, and you know, whether you like it or not, uh, Christopher Lee was probably the actor in that movie who had the most pull, except maybe for Ian McKellen, but like he, he was really big at the time um i mean still you know until he, he died he really was so it, it kind of had that pushing and i also just because i'm thinking about christopher lee another thing that i know is that he spoke about like very um uh positively about the script adaptation and how the movie adapted the source material and he's a person who uh you know one of those crazy people uh, that l- read Lord of the Rings at least once a year. And if Every I may year, ju- like clockwork. <laughs> and if I may jump in really quickly, fun fact about the making of Lord of the Rings, there was only one person out of the whole cast and crew in the making of Lord of the Rings that actually met Tolkien, and that's Christopher Lee. No one else had ever met him, but he did. So we can just, like, you know, lay our swords at his fandom. I think he's the ultimate Tolkien yeah, fan. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think there's no one better than Christopher Lee. May he rest in peace. Yes, I was gonna say, I'm pretty sure he's. Are we, are we all pulling out our Lord of the Rings stuff? Because like, yeah, we, when you get the when you get the box set, some of them had some pretty cool yeah. things in it. Like I had, I, I got nice. this like l- l- little piece of film, and then oh, if, you, so if cool. you guys got like the Minas Tirith like miniature thing, mine is somewhere upstairs. But I was yeah, like I the captive audience. That. See, like I was the one who was. I, I guess they. You know, if you're hooked on the series, then you kind of prided yourself on being the one who made sure, well, yeah, well, I have everything. And you kind of just had this dogmatic fanaticism about the extended editions. Because now if I look back and that dogmatic fanaticism has faded a little bit and I'm not as dogmatic and fanatical on, on the extended editions, I look back and I'm like, I mean, now it's because I got children. It's like, I ain't got time to watch that now, you know, like. I can't blow a whole 14 hour day watching all of them when I used to on a regular basis kind of thing. But there was just kind of like, I'm, I'm watching it not necessarily because it's good filmmaking to watch this huge 14 hour thing, but because, because you're a devoted fan and you, you just had this like sense of achievement by watching and by saying, I'm more committed of a Lord of the Rings fan than you are kind of thing. That was the pride for me being a teenager like from 2001 to, I don't know, for the next 10 years or so until it started to fade and other franchises came and left. But I, yeah, mean, I was totally, thoroughly sold out. <laughs> I had a similar thing, except I never saw, I still haven't seen the theatrical edition of any of them because as I said, we didn't see it in theaters. And when, I, when my parents bought it for us, it was the extended edition. So like, I was definitely very smug about that when I was younger. But I also... <laughs> like. But I also can't really imagine watching the theatrical release now. Like, I can't imagine having seen it first and then going for the extended edition and then maybe fluctuating between the two. But if you start with the extended edition, I feel like it's very hard to watch the other version. I would be curious to see if you did watch the 
theatrical cuts and could tell, like, obviously, I hope you'd be able to tell, like, which scenes were like, oh, where's, where, where's, where, where's that scene? Where's that scene? And it would be interesting to hear, like, how they compare. Because honestly, I have watched the extended cuts every time I've gone to rewatch it since I got the extended cuts, like, gosh, like 15 years ago. So, like, my even, like, before I had my own copies, my family had a copy, right? So I don't remember what the theatrical cuts are like. Because <laughs> all I've watched is the extended since they came out. I mean, they did and a yet... good job of cutting them so that it, it mm-hmm. felt... It, it wasn't just, like, this long, bloated sequence with no VFX or... But they, they did a good job of kind of weaving things in so it looked kind of... Absolutely, yeah. Like, well-transitioned. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm remembering from the extended editions that I missed in the theatrical editions is like, man, there's way more singing <laughs> in the extended yeah. editions. <laughs> there's way more. Whoa. Oh man, like Liv Tyler got a bit, and uh, even Eowyn got a bit. You know, like, mm-hmm. oh, I like that. That was kind of cool. Yeah. And then the Hobbit overindulged. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't even think we're gonna be able to touch that today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just no. too much time. Um, no. Now, Ben, the movie buff. I'm yes. mo- I'm curious to hear from you here because. You weren't a fan of the books, so you didn't. You had no real foundation coming into this. Not much. And you somehow fell in love with this series. So, what is it about these movies that like captured you? I think, like prequel Joe, I, I do kind of have this fascination with world building, with mythical worlds and fantastical worlds. Um, there are all sorts of movies that I love. But I think if you were to look at a list of like my favorite movies of all time, a lot of them tend to be ones um, that deal with some sort of fantastical circumstances or like science fiction. It's like I'm always interested in like the kind of stuff that I know will never happen, but it's cool to imagine what would possibly happen if there was a world like Middle Earth and a ring like this (laughs) was kind of like the most powerful thing you could have. Um, So I think for me, being a, uh, I guess I was like 12 or 13 years old when, when I first saw Fellowship of the Ring, I was already into Star Wars. I was already into a lot of Disney movies that, while they're animated, they still deal with a lot of fantastical circumstances. And I think Lord of the Rings, uh, for me, was kind of... Because you got to understand, like, when I was watching Star Wars as a kid, like, the original trilogy had already been out for many years before I was born. So I got to watch them back to back to back. And seeing Fellowship of the Ring was kind of one of the first times in my life where I saw um, a really cool, fantastical world. And, you know, like looking at these hobbits, I was like, hey, I'm kind of like a hobbit. I have curly hair and I'm short and I like to eat a lot. (laughs) And I mean, like I I was obsessed with (laughs) hobbits after I saw Fellowship of the Ring. Like I totally went outside my bare feet and I was like, oh, yeah, my feet will be fine. You you have a great hobbit cosplay. I have seen that before. Yes, which I've I've done a Mm -hmm. few times and, uh, and, and I do enjoy uh, so yeah, on top of the fantastical world uh, that Tolkien created and the way that they adapted it so brilliantly uh, in the films, I think that captured my attention. And and I think like a, a number of movies I enjoy, while Lord of the Rings is primarily a fantasy movie, there are elements of action and adventure and comedy and romance and even a bit of horror because like I'll agree, like the first time I saw Fellowship of the Ring, it was a mind-blowing experience, but I'll actually... Fun fact, because my parents were concerned about how sensitive I was, I actually saw kind of a slightly edited version uh, of Fellowship of the Ring. So when the <laughs> are, are being born and like they're kind of like ripping out of their sacks, if you will, and like uh, the lurts uh, being beheaded, little scenes like that that my parents thought were too intense for me, I didn't get to see the first time around. And it wasn't until a year or so later when when I, when I saw Two Towers and we were getting close to seeing Return of the King that I actually, when I felt like I got to see like an early unrated cut of the movie because some of these scenes I hadn't seen before. So getting to see that, I was like, yeah, this is so cool. This is so intense. Um, and, and I mean, I, I could go on, but I, I think the other quick thing I just want to touch uh, upon too is that, yeah, so as I was saying earlier, with Star Wars, I could kind of watch them back to back to back and knew, and I knew exactly how it was going to end. With Fellowship of the Ring, because I hadn't read the books, I had no idea how this series was going to continue. I didn't know how it was going to end. So at the end of Fellowship of the Ring, seeing Frodo and Sam walk off, it was like the first time of me feeling what it might be like to be a parent and knowing that I'm so scared for these two hobbits that, you know, don't have much experience going on adventures. 
and, and they're going to go because they have to see this mission through. And I was so scared because I didn't know if they were going to make it uh, or not. So I could go on about how incredible this movie is. And for me, it's the most inspirational movie I've ever seen before because it is literally why I'm working in film, why I'm obsessed with films. Um, but yeah, it, uh, you know, the first time I saw it, it was a life-changing experience. And since then, it was all about Hobbits and Lord of the Rings. There was just nothing else I wanted to do but delve into uh, those two things. So you guys said if you watch all the extended editions, like back to back, it's like 14 hours. Is that correct? Thereabouts. Yeah, I, I actually did look this this up. And if I remember correctly, I, I think it's actually, I think it's close to 12 hours. It probably feels more like 14 because if you're taking <laughs> bathroom breaks and you have to like switch the discs, like it does, it, it does take a while. Uh, yeah. My best friend and I, we actually, uh, two years ago before my first son was born, we did a Middle Earth uh, series marathon and it took us 20 hours to watch all three Lord of the Rings extended and all three Hobbit extended. But yeah, if I remember oh, correctly, all three ex- Lord of the Rings extended amount to about uh, almost 12 hours. Oh, were you allowed just... to fall asleep? <laughs> uh, I, You were allowed, but I did not. I am such a devoted fan. I stayed awake for the whole thing. And my best friend, and it's funny because you mentioned earlier, Average Joe, about like, oh, so many endings and it keeps on going. Oh. My best friend was falling asleep about that time when we were going through all the endings of return of the king and i was just like riley and he's like i'm not sleeping but like i would look at him for five or ten seconds he would be totally <laughs> full with his eyes closed so i'm like i think he did fall asleep briefly but he stayed awake for like 98 percent of the whole experience i just stayed awake for 100 percent. now i realized this wasn't the trend in the early 2000s but as you guys are talking about this it seems like it would have been much better to have taken this 12 hours of content and make it like a streaming series out of it as opposed to trying to like <laughs> shove it into <laughs> three movies because it sounds like there's so much going on that it would work better as episodic content no well i think it, there's a good sense of like how human attention spans have become rapidly marginalized in the last 10 20 years you know like nowadays you know we have barely enough attention span to watch tiktoks reels and things like that let alone having somebody sit through three and a half four hours of content I think there's something to be said about that. I mean, I watched these movies before I had a smartphone, before social media was huge. And so we had way more time and way more attention span. And I think there's something to be said about what the world has done to our brains, where maybe now it wouldn't have as much currency. I have to kind of disagree with you, though, um, about not about the attention span. Sorry, I have to disagree with uh, Average Joe that it would be better as a miniseries. I think that the fact that it got a theatrical release and the fact that that meant that it had to be a movie in which a production team had to work very specifically on the project is part of what made Lord of the Rings work. Like if you look at things like which like Game of Thrones, which admittedly is a much longer series, but at the same time, you lose like from around season three in Game of Thrones, you start visibly losing the aesthetic of the world. Something that because, you know, Lord of the Rings was filmed as, you know, they were all filmed together and it was one project. They kept a completely coherent and cohesive vision throughout, which I think is also something that is very important. Like we talked about why one of the things that it's a faithful adaptation of is making you believe that the mythos of Middle Earth really existed. Because that's one of the things Tolkien wanted to do, was to have, you know, this kind of, like, English mythology. Uh, And that's part of what Lord of the Rings was. And if you look at the movies, and actually anything that is a spinoff, if you look at the, like, the, the video games that came out of the movies, like, everything that was kind of done under that umbrella, the aesthetic is very specific and very you know, well worked out. And of course, having seen the appendices, I know how much effort went into doing that. You know, they got like the two most famous Tolkien illustrators that alive at the time and got them to come in and both of them worked together. And then Peter Jackson had to like get kind of final say on everything to make sure that the entirety of the three movie appeared to be the same universe. And I feel like a TV series could do that but it's very hard to do that. And it probably would end up falling in like falling short on some of the details. It would probably, like you say, comparing it to game of Thrones, like 
it would probably go that way where they're allowed to create more and more content because the source material is literally astronomical like it's an entire it's it's proper high fantasy it's an entire universe but what you would end up with is show creators who extend it longer probably than necessary because they want to make more money and they get bored after a certain point and they just want it to be done with and it doesn't do any of the source material any credit to we're just going to finish this because we're done well and it's the same thing problem that happened with how i met your mother is they extended it an extra however many seasons to make more money because the show was doing well but really the original story only should have been five seasons and i feel like that's what happens with a lot of stuff that it's just it gets milked and everyone's unhappy at the end so we are talking about the hobbit movies <laughs> <laughs> No, we're not. We don't have enough time for that tirade. I did want to say that, um, yeah, well, I think, yeah, I, I don't know if, if the, if like the Lord of the Rings movies, let's say for whatever reason they weren't made 20 years ago and only recently were people trying to figure out how do we do this. I could totally see the producers, whoever is putting together kind of looking at streaming as a viable option because you got to understand, right? Uh, Lord of the Rings is actually one of, um, I guess you could say a pretty fascinating uh, gamble in movie history because yes, there are gambles being taken all the time in regards to how much money you put down to make a movie or such. But think about it, like with Lord of the Rings, initially when they were talking about making these movies because of how expensive they were going to be, one person had the idea of like, well, let's just cram everything into two movies. And thank goodness someone at New Line Cinema had, had the, the right brain to say, well, no, there's three books. Let's do three movies. And I, if I remember correctly, I think all three movies had a $300 million bud budget combined. And instead of picking someone who was like a seasoned blockbuster filmmaker or whatnot, they picked this New Zealander, Peter Jackson, who his biggest movie was like a ghost movie with, um, with Michael J. Fox that I think had maybe, and I'm probably being generous here, like a $15, $20 million budget at the time. So to take someone like him and say, yeah, you're the guy who's going to make this incredible trilogy for us. Like, I'm glad it all worked out. <laughs> and I think a lot of people are too. But imagine, like, if they picked someone else, like, this trilogy could not have worked out. But but they put so much money forward that instead of shooting each movie as its own thing at a time, like, they shot them all together. And I'm glad it worked out the way they did because I don't think you, you make movies like that anymore. It's, it's like once a movie, once a franchise stops making money or whatnot, it's like, oh, the next movie that we're about to film, let's just cancel it because, you know, we just don't trust it anymore. So I, I could see them looking to streaming now is like, oh yeah, maybe this is the way to do it. But I'm, but whether they knew it or not, they did it the right way uh, the first time around. Yeah. I mean, you look at the eight year time span that it took to make the three movies. Mm -hmm. Like people grew up and within that time span and yeah, it, it's no small feat. And I would say, I would say a lot of people look to the Lord of the Rings series as you know, perhaps like a, a long removed predecessor to what we're seeing in the shared universe of of the MCU, where it's yeah. like, wow, if we build this world and want pe people to stay in it somehow, man, this is you know big bucks in a sense. I would say that just to to respond to the streaming idea, or the you know, could it have been better off as a streaming series? I think I think there are market economics at play that that drive what streaming is in that all these huge companies like Amazon, Netflix, everyone's coming up with their own streaming service. Uh, they're in the business of trying to keep your attention for, for as long as possible, because you really can only devote your attention to one thing at a time. So the longer, the more attention they can grab of you, for example, like through a long-term series and the better, because that's time not spent looking at somebody else's IP. Whereas, so, so that's why, things are slowly kind of being siphoned away from big movie, um, you know, franchises into, and kind of finding more long-term currency as, as series, like the way you're seeing things happen with Disney plus or even Amazon prime with, the, um, you know, talk of the, the, the Lord of the Rings thing happening with, with Amazon prime and things like that, because it commands more of the individual watchers attention. The more attention you get, the more you're bought into that particular digital ecosystem, the more time you spend on Amazon prime versus any, anyone else. So I think there's something about that current market reality of the economics of that reality that deeply influenced the way we consume and engage 
with content and with IP. Whereas those things didn't exist in the time of the original three movies. We didn't have these huge digital ecosystems that now are kind of the main way we engage with content. Uh, the thing I wanted to ask about um, something you said, uh, Ben, about um, how New Line approached Peter Jackson. Was it not the other way around? Because I thought that Peter Jackson and his um, his team of artists they already had they already had the idea. They were already working on the script. They already had the concept art, and they'd gone to Miramax. And Miramax said, yeah, okay, but then eventually backed out of the deal. And then they went to New Line and New Line was like, that was the gamble was New Line saying, yeah, sure. It's, yeah, knock your, so you know, knock your socks off. But, um, and Miramax, <laughs> that's one of the reasons I feel like they were involved with, I feel like Miramax was involved with The Hobbit was because they'd been they were kicking themselves because New Line became a proper movie production studio because of Lord of the Rings because they were small time before that and Lord of the Rings was a big gamble for them and they barely uh got convinced to do it. Yeah, you could be right. It's been years since I've seen the uh appendices so I'm Oh no, we yeah. have to rewatch the appendices. Oh, that. <laughs> Sure, oh, sure. No. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Peter Jackson had been working on it beforehand, but he wasn't alone either. There were quite a few people involved. Uh, but yeah, uh, average show. I don't remember if this is on the agenda, but can we talk about what a workshop? Oh yes, let's do that. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think I know what this is. That's the visual effects company that worked yeah, on these movies. Because yeah. we we just talked about like how New Line Cinema became a proper production company but i think that you know out of the legacy of what you know the lord of the rings movies produced out of thin air more or less that's something that we kind of have to talk about mm -hmm. because i mean the creation yeah weta workshop was the visual effects special effects kind of everything uh because i think they also took over the editing by the end of the third movie um for lord of the rings and it was a yeah. new zealand company set in New Zealand and it actually completely, you know, redefined the industry, like the, the entire like um, national economy of New Zealand, that one company and the success of Lord of the Rings. So I don't know. I, I feel like it's something, you know, to talk about the influence of that. And then when we do eventually make the episode on the Hobbit, we can talk about the, you know, the fallout of that. Uh, but yeah, Ben, 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 the movie buff Raleigh has more information than I do. I just remember things from the appendices, like one guy spending eight years making chain mail every day. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, I, think <laughs> Poor man. I, I do remember this correctly. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. There were actually two guys that had miles and miles of this like small tube that they would chop up into little pieces. And yes, they were responsible for making the chain mail, all the chain mail for, for the movie. So they had their very uh, like repetitive task cut out for them. Uh, one thing I did want to point out is that I, I got to give a shout out to, I believe his name is Richard Taylor. I believe he's the mm -hmm. guy that, that um, uh, yeah, did a lot of the design and, uh, and supervision of a lot of the costumes and the weapons and all that. And the appendices for all three movies, uh, I'm sorry. And sorry. Just the weapons. Ni Nyla Dixon did the, all the costuming. Uh, Richard well, Taylor was in charge of the, Maybe he did the weapons and top armor. down of all the uh, the weapons and armor was okay, Richard yeah. Taylor. I think that's what I was thinking costume because yeah, like the armor is kind of part of that. But uh, it, it is fascinating to watch this guy talk. You know, like there there are all sorts of great interviews on the appendices of all these different people who came together to make this movie. But uh, besides Peter Jackson, I feel like when you hear Richard Taylor talk, he is so passionate about what he does. It does not feel like he is phoning anything in. It does not feel like he's like, there's a sword and, you know, it looks cool moving on. He is so passionate and and detailed and thorough about every single thing. And uh, yeah, like he's, you know, there are many geniuses that worked on those movies. But I think when, when we think about the look of the movies, especially when it comes to like the armor and, and, and the weaponry and the, and the creature design and whatnot, um, Richard Taylor rightfully, I think, I think won at least one Oscar, if not more, for his work on the trilogy. And yes, what it workshop was uh, paramount to making Lord of the Rings what it is and, and what we remember it to be today. Well, and they had to develop like 
they developed all their own code for Weta, uh, what yep. became Weta Digital. Uh, so all of the um, all of the mocap uh, motion capture that they developed, all of the um, digital rendering of the armies and all of the battle sequences, all of that was code and programming that they wrote from scratch. There, that software did not exist until Weta Digital created it. And it's now what most people, it's now the bare bones of what most people use for movies nowadays. Hot take is there would be no MCU if it weren't for yeah. the Lord of the Rings yeah, trilogy. There would, there would... Yeah. Well, that that actually like that's a, how I kind of want to wrap up this conversation. Was talking about the legacy of the Lord of the Rings movies. Beeper, I'm gonna take that comment about Weta as your response, so you can't say anything else. Uh, but prequel, <laughs> prequel joke, expand on this idea that you're that you're throwing out there about the MCU. Well, I mean, you think about the MCU before the MCU, before Iron Man, and it was just like, I mean, we got Sam Raimi's Spider Man trilogy. Um, but before that, it was just kind of one-offs and kind of pretty, you know, substandard, lackluster Marvel Daredevil movies, <laughs> Daredevil, oh. things like that. And But then I think what the Lord of the Rings series did was like, you can actually take big risks and do world building and people are all for it. That uh, that people love being taken away into a different world entirely where you might be confused, you might be totally lost, but you're but you're totally mystified and lost in wonder. And it, it, these are big bets, uh, but but it paid off big time. I mean, you, you've seen it. You kind of saw it through the Star Wars and things like that. But but to go this direction with fantasy and um, those kinds of things, I think I think, yeah, like to, to be able to see that you can make these big bets with franchises and spend lots of money uh, and not just look at it purely from, I, I guess, economics of film and seeing what the payoff is. But if you actually deliver like a, 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 a memorable experience that people will create an entire culture or subculture around, uh, then then the, the money will follow as opposed to just trying to create something which we've seen the, the other dark side of uh, as we dive into The Hobbit. <laughs> I don't have as much to say, but one thing that I've observed as a legacy of this film trilogy is the fact that I know that the return of the king is the one that won all the academy awards and i've heard people say i've heard people say it's not necessarily that that is the best movie and it deserved it was like that was kind of like a almost like a, a legacy of like okay we acknowledge that this trilogy accomplished so much oh i don't know maybe it is the best one maybe the, i mean i fell asleep so <laughs> what is that <laughs> um that it says that you need to go watch them but it's amazing that what I think this movie series has done is it really kind of showed the world that genre filmmaking stuff that's based on, you know, frankly, nerd and geek culture content can also just be excellent, high quality film. And it got the attention of the Academy, which really nothing has that come out has come out since Lord of the Rings has been able to do. The MCU didn't get nominated for best picture until black Panther. And that was mostly because of the, uh, political undertones of that movie not because of the quality of the movie it's a good movie but it is not best picture quality uh you know and most big blockbuster movies only get nominated for oscars in like technical categories and lord of the rings was like the one to do it the only other movie that i'm aware of that changed the academy awards and how they do things is beauty and the beast You're assuming the 1991 version, not the 2017 version. <laughs> yeah, the the, the 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 good one. <laughs> All right, Mr. Movie Buff, tell us why. What is the what is your opinion on the legacy of these movies? Uh, in all seriousness, though. Um, there are two periods of fantasy movies and like these, these eras, if you will, are before Lord of the Rings and after Lord of the Rings. There are still lots of good fantasy movies that came out before Lord of the Rings. But I think once Lord of the Rings came along, I think it just kind of showed that people still like 
dare I say, love uh, fantasy movies. And uh, we've seen an explosion of fantasy afterwards, right? I mean, Chronicles of Narnia got greenlit, no surprise, because of the success of Lord of the Rings. And so many other fantasy movies have come along, too. I think also the Game of Thrones series, I could also see them saying that, like, hey, Lord of the Rings did well, so I think we can get, like, a more intense kind of R-rated fantasy series going on that's on HBO instead of in, in theaters. Uh, but yes, uh, Lord of the Rings has quite the legacy. Um, and I think more and more people that, surprisingly enough, may have not seen them yet, will still discover them and say, I can't believe I haven't watched these sooner because they're so amazing. Um, all three movies are in the IMDb Top 250. I'm pretty sure all three movies are like uh, rated amongst the top 20 movies of all time on IMDb. And... Um, yeah, I, I always come back to Lord of the Rings <laughs> for one reason or another. And uh, yeah, it is such an incredible legacy that I'm sure will only continue to be uh, uh, to be amazing because the movies are just brilliant. They uh, I don't know of another trilogy that will ever be that, that will be quite like Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, this is the original Star Wars trilogy for me is like a silver medal when it comes to best movie trilogies. But really, it's Lord of the Rings. It is the best trilogy. It is my favorite trilogy. And I think uh, it will continue to have a, le a lasting legacy because the films are brilliant. All right, Libra, bring us home. What is the <laughs> legacy of this series we haven't already mentioned? Tolkien wrote a short story called Leaf by Niggle. And it's the story of a man who had a vision of a tree and he spent his entire life painting one little leaf. And it was never quite the way he saw it in his dream. Now, that story is a microcosmic autobiography. Tolkien had this huge world in his head. And he only got to write a piece of it. At least that's the way he thinks of it. Now, I think what the films have done is added a lot more leaves to that tree. And because they're film, because books are not always as easily accessible, which is a sad story in and of itself. But I think the films not only introduced to new generations Tolkien's work, but also made it po and like established such a concrete, di distinguished aesthetic that that like people will be able to build on that work with their own art and their own mediums. Like the we're talking about the video games and more movies and <sighs> the merits of the Hobbit films are to be debated, but the artwork and all of the everything else that has come out of these films to me is just honoring Tolkien's dream. And I think that's the best thing an adaptation could ever do. So one does not simply do a single episode on the Lord of the Rings movies. <laughs> we, we've been talking for well, over thanks. an hour now and we've barely even scratch the surface of what actually happens in the films. And I think that just speaks to how big this is. And, you know, that's okay because we're not ending this podcast in the immediate future. So there will be another opportunity, I'm sure, to discuss Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And who knows when the new Amazon series comes out, there'll probably be another chance for us to collectively hold our breaths and see what happens. So we should do an extended edition podcast. <laughs> uh, so, Four and a half hours long. If you're if you're one of those people who has not seen the Lord of the Rings movies yet, even though I have yet to actually sit through them all myself, I would I would recommend them. They they are definitely quality films. I'm not going to argue that point at all. And you know we have four people here today who love these movies, and I am the minority who is indifferent. Uh, <laughs> so, f f you know, eighty percent of people in this room think they're amazing so that's a pretty good uh metric of quality if you go get some spouses and make it a higher percentage yep uh are they available for like legal streaming in it right now i think they're on netflix they're on I and off think netflix yeah i yeah the theatrical versions were on netflix for a little while yeah 
I think Netflix is um, your best to bet because they're definitely not on Disney mm-hmm. Plus, probably not on Prime, but I see them on Netflix no. here and there. You Americans probably have them on HBO Max. <laughs> ah! Yeah, maybe. Well, I have the DVDs if you want to borrow them, and Ben has the Blu-ray. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Call me up. I might go for the Blu-rays because they're, they're a little nicer. Yeah. They're not presently on Netflix. Oh, they're okay. not? Shoot. Nope. All right. Well, I mean, support the physical disc industry. Mm. I'm, I'm in favor of that. So, you know, go out and buy the things. You'll, have, you'll, be, it's, you'll get your bang for your buck because there's so much content. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Enough entertainment for a year. Just got to go find a DVD player. So if you uh, want to send us some mail, because we don't have any this week, we'll remind you how you can get a hold of us. If you want to reach the show, you can send us an email at batjarpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can tweet us at the Bat Cookie Jar. You can find the Bat Jar Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, because we got a channel. Share our posts on Facebook, write reviews, give our shows a rating. This will help all people join us inside the Bat Jar, and we appreciate it dearly. So normally we would go inside the bachelor and pull out our topic for next week, but Beeper, I want to just check in with you. Are, are you, we haven't talked about the new Ghostbusters yet? Would you want to cover that next week? Was that the one I said I wanted to see? Yes. I still haven't seen it, but um, you know what? You got a week. Honestly, I I, I have a week and a baby. Uh, but uh, even if we do, if I don't get to see it, we can we can go ahead with it because I I think the people want to hear about it and. I have seen enough around the movie that it seems like it'd be worth doing an episode on for sure. Or we can talk about the different versions of a Christmas Carol that have been done because we're getting Ooh. closer to Christmas now. That'd be Make fun. sure you include the Muppets. Yes. Yes. The Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> it's really, the, it's, it's the best one. It really is. Tell um, me. Uh, uh, okay, maybe we should maybe we should do that then. <laughs> okay, fine. It's the only one I remember. I'm down to quite enjoy a good Christmas carol. All right, well there you go. Next week we're going to be discussing the various film and television adaptations of a Christmas Carol, and the correct answer is Scrooge. That's the best version. All right, mm, here we that's go. That's a really good one too. Um, so we want to thank all of our friends in the Two Towers for joining us today. Uh, prequel joe for being a first time guest thank you for being part of today's conversation you have a lovely uh background with some fake real plants are those real plants there are no windows so they're not real <laughs> and to, uh, <laughs> to ben the movie buff and libra you guys uh it's been great having you on once again i mean i appreciate the passion for the content because obviously i don't have it this week it comes very easy i think i speak on behalf of libra yeah no no effort with that oh yeah we love them So until next time, when we talk about various adaptations of A Christmas Carol, I'm Average Joe. I'm Before Cribs. I'm Ben the Movie Buff. I'm Libra the Book Lady. I'm Prequel Joe. Catch on the flip side. Heed me! (laughs) See you in the next one. See you between the shelves. The prequel was better.